Welcome, Welcome to Democracy Today. Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Narmeen Sheikh. The United Nations warns one out of every 10 people around the planet faced hunger in 2022, an increase of more than 120 million people compared to the year before the pandemic. As many as 783 million people went hungry last year. The UN says Africa remains the worst affected region, with one in five people facing hunger on the continent. The findings come as Russian President Vladimir Putin is threatening to abandon the Black Sea Grain deal brokered by the UN and Turkey which grants Ukraine safe passage to export food and fertilizer. Unless Russia agrees to an extension, the agreement will expire on Monday. In Kyiv, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky accused Putin of using food as a weapon. It is very important that there are no threats to food security anywhere in the world. And Russia must clearly realize that anyone who increases the threat of famine, particularly in critical regions of Africa, is terrorizing the whole world with hunger, not just someone individually. A senior commander of Russian forces in occupied southern Ukraine says he was fired after he accused Russia's defense minister of betraying troops under his command. In an audio recording posted online by a prominent Russian lawmaker, Major General Ivan Popov, who led Russia's occupation in Ukraine's Zaporizhia region, lashed out at Russian defense minister Sergei Shoigu and Valery Gyar Giraisimov, the commander of Russia's invasion force in Ukraine. Popov blamed the men for mass deaths and injuries of Russian soldiers and blasted them for not supplying troops with enough weapons and ammunition. Our army has not been crushed from the front by the Ukrainian army, but has been attacked from the rear by our commanding officers. They traitorously and villainously beheaded the army in its most tense moment. On Thursday, Russian President Vladimir Putin said publicly the Wagner Group had no legal basis and said the private mercenary company's legal status needs further consideration. The Pentagon says it believes Wagner forces are no longer participating in Russian military operations in Ukraine in any significant way, following Wagner's failed June 23rd revolt. The whereabouts of Wagner's former leader, Yevgeny Prigozhin, remain unknown. Russian lawmakers have unanimously approved a new law banning gender affirming and other medical care marked, for right. transgender people. The measure will marked. also annul marriages of trans people and prohibit them from becoming foster or adoptive parents. This is the latest attack on LGBTQIA Russians who face an intensifying crackdown over the last decade under President Vladimir Putin. This is a Russian LGBTQIA rights activist. According to this research, 72% uh, of uh, trans people um, experience depression or attempted suicide. 72% of Russian trans people. This statistic is huge. Massive. Um, and I can predict this uh, law was... Uh, this, is, this will lead to increasing this mm -hmm. uh, numbers. The FDA has approved the first over-the-counter birth control pill to be sold in the United States. Opil is expected to be available from brick-and-mortar stores and online early next year. The milestone comes amid the Republican assault on reproductive rights and one year after the Supreme Court reversed the constitutional right to an abortion. The manufacturer, Dublin-based Perigo, has not specified the price of Opil yet, but said it is committed to making it, quote, accessible and affordable to all. In other reproductive rights news, abortion providers in Iowa have filed a lawsuit against the state's recently passed six-week abortion ban. Governor Kim Reynolds is expected to sign the bill into law today. The Health and Human Services Department has confirmed the death of an unaccompanied migrant child who'd been in its custody since May. A 15-year-old migrant girl from Guatemala, whose name has not been released, died Monday of multi-organ failure at a hospital in El Paso, Texas. She reportedly suffered from an underlying illness. She's the fourth migrant child to die in U.S. custody this year, as officials have been accused of severe medical neglect and other abuses. 
Canada's interagency forest fire center says it's monitoring 906 active wildfires from coast to coast, as smoke from the unprecedented blazes is forecast to head south today, triggering another round of air quality alerts in the Midwestern United States. This comes as a massive heat dome stretching across the U.S. is set to intensify over the weekend, impacting over 100 million people. On Thursday, Phoenix, Arizona logged its 13th consecutive day of temperatures above 110 degrees Fahrenheit, with the city on track to break its all-time record of such scorching hot days next week. Actors unionized with SAG-AFTRA are officially on strike as of today. Some 160,000 Screen Actors Guild members are joining around 11,000 film and television writers who've been on the picket line since May, effectively bringing Hollywood to a standstill. The strike prohibits members from both acting in and promoting films and TV shows. Actors are demanding better wages, residual pay and protections in an era where streaming services dominate and AI threatens the livelihood of entertainers. This is SAG after President Fran Drescher. It is a slippery slope into a very dangerous time and a real dystopia if big business corporations think that they can put human beings out of work and replace them with artificial intelligence. It's dangerous and it's without thinking or conscience. We'll have more on the strike by Hollywood actors and writers later in the broadcast. In Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a federal grand jury has ruled the man responsible for the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in U.S. history is eligible for the death penalty. The 50-year-old gunman was found guilty last month on 63 federal hate crime and civil rights charges for his attack on worshippers at the Tree of Life Synagogue in 2018. He still faces state charges, including 11 counts of murder. Writing in the foreword, Beth Kisseler, the, the wife run. of Rabbi Jonathan Perlman, who survived the massacre, said she was glad the jury found the shooter guilty and eligible for the death penalty, but added, quote, I hope they do not vote to carry it out. The best way to commemorate those lost is not to focus on revenge, but to find a meaningful way to emulate their deeds and honor them, unquote. Fox News is facing another defamation lawsuit for spreading falsehoods in the wake of the 2020 election. On Wednesday, Trump supporter Ray Epps sued the far-right network after former host Tucker Carlson repeatedly accused him of being an undercover FBI agent who incited the January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. Epps says he and his family have since received death threats. His lawsuit states, quote, as Fox mm. recently learned in its litigation against Dominion voting Fox. systems, its lies have consequences. In April, Fox News paid $787 million to settle Dominion's lawsuit, charging the network defamed the voting machine company by airing false conspiracy th theories it helped rig the presidential election. Fox News still faces a $2.7 billion lawsuit brought by Smartmatic, another maker of electronic voting machines. Egypt has announced the sale of $1.9 billion in state assets amid an economic crisis and record high inflation. The sale of 32 state companies, including hotels, telecom and oil firms, to Egyptian investors and a United Arab Emirates investment fund is part of a turn towards privatization. Egypt has also imposed austerity measures, including cuts to subsidies for fuel, water and electricity, in exchange for billions of dollars in loans from the International Monetary Fund. Nearly one third of Egypt's population lives in poverty, according to government figures. And in Italy, outrage is mounting after a judge cleared a school employee of groping a 17-year-old student, arguing the assault didn't constitute a crime because it lasted less than 10 seconds. The student from a Rome high school reported the 66-year-old employee after the incident last year. He admitted to touching the student without consent, but claimed it was a joke. Social media users have responded by posting videos in which they grope themselves for 10 seconds, accompanied by hashtags which translate to hashtag 10 seconds and hashtag brief groping. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Nermeen Sheikh. Amy Goodman is traveling today and will be back on Monday. Oh, Amy's gone? Okay. That's weird because she didn't put out videos the day before. I wonder. I was wondering if something happened to her.
Television and film actors are heading to the picket line today after the National Board of the Screen Actors Guild voted unanimously to go on strike. The vote came after talks with a federal mediator aimed at hammering out a new labor contract failed at the 11th hour. More than 160,000 members of the union are taking part in the first major actor strike since 1980. The strike comes two and a half months after Hollywood screenwriters also walked off the job. This marks the first time since 1960 that actors and screenwriters have been on strike at the same time. As actors join writers on the picket line, they're demanding better pay and protections in an era where streaming services dominate and artificial intelligence threatens the livelihood of entertainers. SAG-AFTRA president Fran Drescher spoke Thursday. What happens here is important because what's happening to us is happening across all fields of labor by means of when employers make no way out of there. Wall Street and greed their priority and they forget about the essential contributors that make the machine run. We are the victims here. We are being victimized by a very greedy entity. I am shocked by the way the people that we have been in business with are treating us. Oh. I cannot believe it, That's quite frankly. How far apart we are on so many things. How they plead poverty that they're losing money left and right when giving hundreds of millions of dollars to their CEOs. The entire business model has been changed by streaming, digital, AI. This is a moment of history that is a moment of truth. If we don't stand tall right now, we are all going to be in trouble. We are all going to be in jeopardy of being replaced by machines. You cannot change the business model as much as it has changed and not expect the contract to change too. We're not going to keep doing incremental changes on a contract that no longer honors what is happening right now with this business model that was foisted upon us. What are we doing? Moving around furniture on the Titanic? It's crazy. So the jig is up, AMPTP. We stand tall. You have to yeah, wake up and smell actors. the coffee. We are only labor and workers. we stand tall. And we demand respect. And to be honored for our contribution, you I'm share the fuck about anyone else. because you cannot this exist ain't about solidarity. without us. I might use the language, but they don't Thank give a you. fuck. They don't care about the grocery store worker. They don't care about the, the steel worker. That was SAG after President Fran Drescher, who's well known for her role in the 1990 sitcom The Nanny. The Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, which represents major television and film producers, yeah, accused the actors' the union of walking away from fucked. negotiations. In a statement, way, way, AMPTP way said demanded. its offer included historic pay and residual increases, as well as a, quote, groundbreaking AI proposal that protects actors' digital likenesses. Well, to talk more about the strike, we're joined by Shan Sharma. He's an actor who's part of the SAG-AFTRA negotiating committee. One note of disclosure, Democracy Now! employees are represented by SAG-AFTRA, but are covered by a different union contract than actors. Shan Sharma is joining us from Salt Lake City, Utah, where he's been filming the fourth season of The Chosen. Shan, welcome to Democracy Now! If you could respond, oh, explain and elaborate the reasons for for this strike? What are the demands? Nope, nope, nope. Well, first of all, we didn't ask for this strike. We've been nope, negotiating in good faith for over a month. We had a truncated negotiation window to begin with simply because of the Writers Guild negotiations and then the Directors Guild negotiations giving us just three weeks. We came in with a very fair package from the very beginning of the process, and it became clear to us pretty quickly that the representatives of our employers were not interested in negotiating with us in the same way, and they were stalling us. Uh, we granted a unprecedented 12-day extension to continue to negotiate. 
which they wasted, canceled meetings, and uh, seems like it was just a ploy to try to promote their summer movies before they knew we would eventually have to go on strike because there seems to be a concerted effort by these companies to try to break the entertainment unions. Uh, DGA did not fight them in the way that the Writers Guild is and now SAG-AFTRA is and so they want to impoverish us in order to force us to accept a bad deal. And Sean Sharma, could you explain uh, the concerns around streaming as well as uh, artificial intelligence? Well, streaming, of course, this is the first year that streaming became the primary way that people consume their media. And our contracts are built for a very different time stemming from linear television on broadcast networks and cable. So there was a relationship between the shows needing to grab audiences and sell advertising, and we would have a participation in kind of a long tail of revenue that is generated by both the initial broadcast of a program and also the syndication of programs. Now, with streaming, they've gotten rid of any of those yeah, performance-based uh, tails sucks, of bro. revenue that we participate in for yeah, a subscription fee that they collect, but we don't share any part of that revenue. So we have been squeezed down and shoved oh, out of participating in a major way that our members support themselves financially. With artificial intelligence, they now have the technology and are fighting to try to alter the, the proposals we have to protect our members, they've tried to reconfigure and rewrite the proposals that we're just asking for for basic human right protections to try to have the right to scan us, own our likeness in perpetuity, including after we're dead, use us in their movies without any consent, without any compensation to our performers, especially background performers. It's inhumane, it is dystopian, uh, and it's very frightening because we just saw through the pandemic that performers help our culture survive through, for example, a once in a generation or once in a lifetime health emergency. And at a time- Yeah, our thank, thank God for the entertainers saving our lives during a health emergency. Thank God for the entertainers. I can't think of anyone else who had more of a hand in taking care of the American people than our entertainers. God bless our entertainers. God bless the USA. I'm a fucking chud. Um, this guy's just basically like, actor important. It's clearer to the community than ever. It seems our employers wanted to be oh, more it. than ever. Well, as we mentioned, you know, the last time that writers and directors were, were on strike was in 1960 at the time, just to give a sense mm -hmm. of uh, how much things have changed. Of course, there was neither streaming nor artificial intelligence. And Ronald Reagan mm -hmm. was the president of SAG, which had not yet merged with uh, mm -hmm. uh, AFTRA. At the time, at the end of the strike, yeah, both unions had won like health care benefits, I'm pensions, fine. and movie oh, residuals. Well. If you could comment on that and what you're still hoping may come out of this when are talks set to resume well we don't have any talks that are scheduled to resume because we just declared the strike yesterday good. two nights ago we sat across from our employers representatives and we said we are ready to negotiate in good faith but you have clearly not been operating in good faith there were threats against our members made by the negotiator by their side. They just the get paid per episode. It's not like even threatening our if careers. you watch an episode they twice, they don't the get press. paid. For that. They leaked things to the press to violate the media episode, blackout. They, they insulted children and the rights. They of just hate being treated like everybody else. I get it. Their health and pension. And the Hollywood elites want their residual income. It has been unconscionable what we've witnessed. It's like sitting across the table from the sociopathy that seems to be in charge of corporate America today, where. Uh, Apparently, CEOs can get performance-based bonuses. Oh, CEOs can get performance. Wait, so you're telling me you want this for everybody? Because I don't just want it for you. I don't want it for these fucking libbed-up actors. Make all of that possible. Do not. It's fucking um, libby so libs. It's, uh, it, it's frightening, the situation that we're faced with. Um, so there's no current talks that are, uh, that are scheduled. As for the 1960s, I wouldn't be an actor today if it wasn't for the health plan that was established at great cost by the sacrifices of our members in 1960. No, no, these are like the screen actors, and they're just like, he's saying, like, a, we kept America going during the pandemic, and now we're being we treated like this, like, this some day. fucking, like, and like, he's super important, you know what I mean? So, like, I'm not anti-writer, but I'm anti-Hollywood. I'm definitely anti, like, big media. I'm anti, like, all these fucking libs crying about, like, you know, we're not getting paid per ad, you know what I mean? 40 years to the point I'm not anti any like worker but I'm anti this entitlement you know what I mean Great do I believe people should be paid an equitable wage yes do I think you should be making residuals on every single episode until the end of time no like it's not like we're making residuals on the shit that we're making for companies right so like unless we're getting that shit I don't think they deserve that shit and they're just they're wham 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 entitled 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 right like 
That's my take. That's my take when it comes to fucking actors and like, you know, people who work in entertainment who think all of a sudden, hey, what's up, Mork? They're entitled. Um, and it's like, yeah, it was that way. It was that way for a long time. They would get paid per rerun. They would get paid per ad watched by each American eyeball. And yeah, it's changed. That sucks. Are all of us in work situations we don't like? Yes. Do I think these people should be getting fucked? No. Do I think they should be making exorbitantly more than you and me? No. Screen Actors Guild. He gave up all of his residuals before yeah, 1960. This is the one thing that they want. The they they don't give a fuck about, like I said, the grocery the store worker. They don't give a fuck about anybody else. They care the about the plan was the forced actors. To make changes because That's our all. Employers That's all. They don't give a shit. not improved the employer pension and health contribution caps, the pension and health contribution caps that fund our health plans. So uh, we are in an existential moment, both with AI, but we're also in an existential moment to the basic rights of health care and the ability to pursue what we love and have retirement income after a prosperous career. Well, Sean, you mentioned, of course, uh, corporate America yeah, bunch, yeah. and the position of uh, prominent CEOs. Let's go uh, to uh, Disney CEO Bob Iger, who appeared on CNBC. Mm -hmm. Monday and criticized the actors' union oh my God, for calling bro. a strike. I'm getting caught out of the team fight. It's very disturbing to me. I, you know, we've talked about uh, disruptive forces on this business and all the challenges that we're facing and the recovery from COVID, which is ongoing. It's not completely Loves the more back. collective worker action. This is the I love it, but I wish they would just come out for grocery workers and for Uber drivers and for restaurant workers and for you know not just be coming out of their fucking Hollywood McMansions because now they're not getting residuals on their shows. You know what I mean? I'm in the world to add like, I wish to they were disruption. And it wasn't There's just a, level uh, of expectation a fucking that they horse have and pony show. That is just not realistic. And they are adding to a set of challenges that this business is already facing. Yeah, that is yeah. Quite like, frankly, very disruptive. Not just for writers and screen uh, screen actor guilds and just like, you know what I mean? Just they, like, I know they're for not. normal not? working people. I can't, I can't, I can't answer that question. Not for these people who so got that was extremely Disney CEO lucky. Rob and, Iger, who yeah, they live in LA, so they need more money, right? Like $27 million a year. He was speaking from Sun Valley, mm -hmm. Idaho, yeah, happen, where yeah. he's attending a gathering that has been described as a summer camp for a no, billionaire. No, bro. Like honestly, okay. So I'm talking about I'm talking about the Screen Actors, right? We're talking about like Screen Actor Guild or whatever, right? And a lot of like there is Fran from the Nanny who was talking out. So these people are not poor at all, but they say they need more money, right? Because cost of living and this and that and the other thing. We all do, and they're not getting residuals anymore. None of us get residuals on our work. So if you could uh, respond mm -hmm. to what he says and also explain, you know, people have a sense that Hollywood is all about uh, celebrity and enormous sums of money for performers. But I just want to quote um, what actor Denise uh, Cabanella said on Thursday. She said it's a very, very small percentage of the 160,000 plus member union that can actually make mm -hmm. a living off the work that That's we correct. do. So <laughs> yeah. uh, if you could yeah, talk yeah. about that, respond to what the Disney CEO said. Oh, that's great. That's and then awesome. What, it's in awesome. Fact, and yeah, it how should, many people it's make getting a so much win. attention because of who these people are, and I hope it opens more eyes. That's the only good thing I see in this. I hope it opens more eyes. You know what I mean? That's important to me. Age from these acting. people aren't important to me. I'm going to be honest. Yeah, that that fucking uh, actors and thespians and shit. I do not give a fuck. Uh, sad for anybody who works. Y'all got a cushy existence. You know, if you're a fucking thespian, you got a cushy ass existence. I'm not going to lie. for him to be paid as highly as if you're in the thespian paid, guild. You got a cushy um, ass existence. It, it's it's so tone from reality. to think that someone like him who can, you know, get all the I think in his contract he's going to get a 500 percent bonus to his base salary based on the performance. I grew up in LA. I know a lot of these stock, fucking weirdos. Whereas I've been to their houses that give that company its value, they are refusing to allow us to participate in the revenue that we generate Let's for school them. their kids, These you know? These companies have engaged in an absolutely reckless spending on programming over the last few years trying to compete for subscriptions, which we don't participate in any so of that So now you're revenue. meta capitalism. Now you're meta capitalism because it's not benefiting you. And now that they've overextended themselves and are starting to shift to a more... When it was benefiting you, you were gung-ho about it. ...to television... Uh, now they're claiming poverty simply because Wall Street is not demanding growth. It's demanding profitability. That is not our fault. Yeah, exactly. Fuck Hollywood. Those risks that these companies have taken is on our backs. And for him to lecture us about being disruptive, they have disrupted the lives of all of our members who are trying to make a living in this industry. Shame on him for saying something like that. As our president said, the reason we have unions is because people do not do the right thing. And as somebody who's made his career out of entertainment, he should know better than to condescend to the incredible performers that give his company value yeah uh, so I, I don't really know what else to say about that
Otherwise, it's a Could bunch you talk of. Could about the issue of audition that. pay, which has been required for over 86 years, We're but has too. never been put pay into attention to us. Well, I do not care. True. In the early days of our union, everybody was under contract. Almost all of our performers were contract oh, players gosh, at MGM or Paramount or Disney, etc. Which means not only were they paid for their auditions, they were also paid uh, for a weekly salary. They were also developed with acting classes, dancing classes, movement, etc. A, a great comprehensive classical training because we were assets of these studios. When the Olivia de Havilland decision challenged those contracts, those contract systems and what used to be known as the star system, the studio star system, started to end. Uh, for, for independent performers who weren't- Come on, bro. You can't do anything with that? creative labor that the we fair. put into our auditions. But now, since uh, the studio star system has gone away, Virtually none of us are under contract. The audition pay provisions of our contract ensure that the creative labor that we put into the pre-production <laughs> process of productions, where we actually exactly. interpret the material. Imagine trying to get Ted Grosz to unionize. That would be fucking hell. That's what the ninth layer of hell looks like in Dante's Inferno. We write the part, straight up. rewrite the script, so we contribute our intellectual property to the pre-production process, and that was always meant to be compensated for. But today, see, we now they're mad. Now they're mad because the work aren't being compensated according to the output the actual value that you're bringing and now they're mad about that hmm hmm sounds communist now sounds communist to carry hmm. the burden of the casting the capital C because with the capital they're no longer doing in-person casting they're forcing us to tape ourselves in our own homes using our friends and family as also free labor for these auditions and they expect us to do it all without compensation our members were not aware that these provisions were in our contract because we have a contract literacy challenge within our union where our members do not read and are not educated properly about their contracts we are changing that but none of that changes the fact that not only are we doing the technical labor that casting used to do, we're doing the creative labor we've always done, and now our friends and family are being treated as free employees for our oh, employers as bro. well to read with us for our auditions. So audition pay is a very important way that we can inject almost a billion dollars into our working class members of the union, which by the Damn. way, your previous question, only 12.5% of our members qualify for health insurance. Okay. And the qualifying threshold for health insurance is only $26,470. That means 87% of our members do not earn over $26,000 a year. And that's a shocking thing for the, the performers of 170,000 strong this performers libertarian that idiots the TV and film work that is professional that the AMPTP doofuses. produces. Thanks so Sucking much, Sean Sharma. Uh, Sean Sharma is an actor and a member of the SAG after a negotiating committee. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I'm Nermeen Sheikh. We turn now to look more at this week's major NATO summit in Lithuania, where the military alliance agreed to invite Ukraine into NATO at some point once conditions are met. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky blasted Fuck the me. lack of a timeline as Transit absurd. This comes as NATO Doing is moving closer songs. to expanding once again. Earlier this week, Turkey dropped its opposition to inviting Sweden into NATO. Once formally approved, Sweden will become the 32nd nation in NATO, which began in in 1949, with 12 founding members. We're joined now by Gray Anderson. He's the editor of the new book, NATO Paltonism, The Atlantic Alliance Since the Cold War. He co-authored a recent piece for The New York Times titled, NATO Isn't What It Says It Is. Uh, Gray Anderson, welcome to Democracy Now! If you could first respond uh, to what happened at the NATO summit in Vilnius this week. Yeah, thank you for having me on. I suppose the two big news items, which you've just mentioned, consist in Turkey's abandonment of opposition to Swedish accession to the alliance and the refusal to grant Ukraine more kind of concrete guarantees concerning the timeline for its own eventual membership. I don't think either of these developments is terribly surprising to anyone who's been following the story as it has unfolded. Uh, at the same time, one can understand, I think, why the government in Kiev was disappointed not to receive 
more substantial guarantees. Fuck, bro, come on. Uh, Stephen Wertheim was oh on the show recently, and he rightly invoked the precedent of another You're summit so silly 15 years that. ago oh in Bucharest, at which the alliance on the initiative of George Wait, W. Like Bush... A, bro, he sounds like a Libyan character, and he looks like a Wes Anderson character. <laughs> ...decision to promise not just Ukraine, <laughs> but Georgia, eventual membership in the alliance. And I think... Although he looks like he's about to tell you a riddle and do a little diddly. And NATO expansion and triggering this conflict has been very controversial. Uh, today, most, I think, people would agree that this 2008 decision was a fiasco. It was neither fish nor fowl. Uh, the promise of membership one oh, day fuck. without a timeline or any more precise notion of when it might occur was sufficiently strong to provoke Russia, as many warned at the time, including in the State Department and the administration, uh, without offering Ukraine security guarantees substantial enough to deter eventual Russian aggression. So I think one can, uh, one can perfectly well understand why the Ukrainian leadership today is extremely sensitive to any sign that American and NATO support might be waning. And, Gray Anderson, could you speak specifically about the significance of Finland joining? Finland, of course, shares an 830-mile border with Russia. I think, to an extent, Finland's membership and what looks to be Sweden's membership don't change a lot. Both have been very active in the alliance for some time, including on the military what? side, participating Nobody. in joint maneuvers and Bro. what have you. Uh, the prospect of actually creating a plan to defend, as you say, this extraordinarily long frontier with Russia uh, does underscore uh, the element of irrealism, I suppose, in alliance military planning. And so explain, Gray Anderson, your piece uh, uh, co-authored with uh, Thomas Meany in The New York Times is headlined, NATO isn't what it says it is. Uh, explain what you mean three by that yon. and what is Bro, three NATO? Nine yon. Well, NATO historically has claimed to be, I think, three things, really. The first is a collective defense organization, a military alliance. The second, an alliance of values. The third, an alliance of democracy. An alliance of so democracy. to take these three claims in reverse order, it's quite clear from the history of the alliance that um, the democratic character of member states was open to negotiation or perhaps observed more in the breach. Salazar's Portugal, of course, was a founding member. Greece, under the colonels, remained on good terms with the alliance. And today, I don't think anyone would argue that Turkey, Poland, say, Hungary, are great advertisements for the sort of liberal democracy touted by uh, the alliance yeah, that's commanders. Kind of and on the question of values, I think much the same thing can be said. Um, it bears mentioning, I suppose, as well, that when voters in member states or potential member states have shown signs of disapproving of membership or a lack of eagerness in enlisting in this American-led military organization, their voices have most often simply been dispensed with. On the specifically defense or security aggregating no side idea, of the equation, throughout the Cold War, NATO's claims to mount a conventional defense of Europe were always rather far-fetched and, I think, recognized as such. Uh, since the end of the Cold War, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, one could, in fact, argue that far from strengthening European security, NATO, by precluding the creation of any more kind of coordinated, autonomous European defense, has actually weakened the member states that compose it. Um, so I think on all three of those points, you know, one can say that NATO indeed isn't what it has professed to be. On the other hand, uh, if you look at the Damn. history of U.S. debates around the alliance and its function, really from its inception, when the pact oh, turned into me, an organization so at the turn of the 1950s, there was quite self-conscious recognition of the fact that this was an excellent oh. vehicle for defending U.S. interests in Europe and preventing the emergence of any rival power that might threaten to hegemonize the continent. So in that respect, one has to say that there are deep continuities in NATO's functioning, and it has been a quite remarkable success.
And you write in the New York Times piece, uh, quote, NATO is working Doing exactly as it was designed by post-war U.S. planners, drawing Europe into a dependency on American power that reduces its room for maneuver. Far from a costly charity program, NATO secures American influence in Europe oh, on shit. the cheap. Bro, so, so if you could explain how precisely oh, is it uh, that uh, NATO's presence in Europe enables wild. the U.S. to defend its own interests wild. in Europe by weakening the capacity of sovereign U uh, European states uh, to pursue their own uh, defense objectives and economic, as, as you say. Um, well, in a very we'll concrete we'll way, in uh, NATO, no, 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 by no, no, imposing yeah, just, well, a regime theorized by Madeleine Albright in the that. 90s uh, on, the, on the eve of the first big wave of post-Cold War expansion, described as the three Ds, that is to say, oh, NATO no, 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 no. in its relationship to Europe forbids any right, duplication well, of American capabilities by Europeans, oh, uh, any nice delinking yeah, cool. of go, European security from American interests, game, American up, objectives, bro, and any discrimination oh, God, on the part of Europeans against yeah, non-EU NATO members. And one effect Yay. of that is, in a very kind of concrete way, to make Europeans dependent bro, upon American doctrine, upon American materiel, Weapon systems, Alex, leadership, command. So those are all Alex, ways, I suppose, in which this uh, relationship of dependency is quite visible. There are less visible ways in which European dependence on the U.S. for security Alex, chonky, gives America leverage over other types of decision. So we might oh, get to this it. in a minute. But if one looks at Europe's relationship to China currently in the context here, of Sino-American tensions, uh, when the U.S. decided oh to God, impose effectively an embargo on here. certain types of technology, uh, microchip technology, screaming, going to China, one really is struck by how quickly the Europeans fell in line, in particular the Dutch, uh, who accepted, I think, just a couple of months ago, these restrictions. So that's sort of the tip of the iceberg, as it were and what's most easily seen and quantified. He's eating it. And finally, uh, Gray Anderson, uh, you quote in your piece uh, French President e Emmanuel Macron he on the it. eve of a uh, uh, NATO summit four it? years ago, effectively saying that good? NATO was undergoing nothing short of, quote, brain death. In other words, the alliance was extremely weak. That was four years ago. So is it because of Russia's okay, invasion you know, that the right. alliance has now been not only resuscitated, so but in fact strengthened. Yeah, I think it's in part due to the invasion, although one might be tempted to look okay. even further back since, since 2014 with the crisis in Ukraine, Russia's annexation of Crimea, one has seen greater outlays on defense on the part of Europeans and a kind of reassertion of America's role on the continent. We went hard this has agree. gone through ups and downs, NATO throughout its history has famously been plagued by uh, crises of one sort or another. But I think there's no arguing that over the past year or so, uh, it has been dramatically oh, strengthened, and America's hand in Europe quite remarkably strengthened as well. Remarkably. Well, we want to thank you so much for joining us. Gray Bro, Anderson I don't even is the think he's European. Of NATO Politanism, the Atlantic I don't Alliance even think this motherfucker is European. War. What's his name? We Here, hold up. Greg, I don't even think this oh, Hold up. We need to investigate. We need to uh, accent investigate this guy. We got to accent investigate this guy. Gray Anderson Nato Politanism. This is why the left can't win. Yeah, I know, right? Gray Anderson origin. Where are you from, motherfucker? Where, what block are you repping? France? Is he France? Is he France? Is this man France himself? No, oh, no, he's an American historian. He holds a doctorate from Yale. That's why he speaks that way, because he has a doctorate from Yale. His research focuses on the political and military histories of contemporary Europe. Yeah, he wrote a book about France, you know, about some coupes, coop, about uh, some coupes, some vehicles known as coupes. I'm kidding, guys, it's a coup. Uh, yeah. Good for him. He don't. He shouldn't be talking like that, though. That's stolen valor, brother. You ain't no European. You probably um, like that guy who faked being British. 
Mm, bro, I love I love um that stolen valor. I love pretending to be a Brit. Oi, bro. You know, I'll be lying if I said I never did it for certain things. Add time. No, it's because he's a doctorate from Yale. Sorry. Sorry, liberal. Sorry, liberal. It's because he's a doctor from Yale. Um, British. He's British. He's high on his own farts, bro. He's sniffing his own fumes. <laughs> he's sniffing his own fumes, bro. I'm going to eat another bite of chili. I turn the corner, and my cat has his leg like, he's like, he's just looking at me, eye contact, direct, big eyes, leg like this, over his head, and I'm like, bruh, I mean, actually, actually, he's just like, he's got his leg straight up, and he's like, he's like, and what about it, and he's like, and what about it? All right. And it's like how flexible I am. You guys see that shit? Goddamn. To your recent New York Times article, NATO isn't what it says it is. See you, governor. Hello, governor. Hello, puppet.
Here, I'll listen to you. This is like above his head and he's staring at me and I'm like, all right, bro. Damn, okay. Now democracy. See, I interrupted something. My apologies. My sincerest apologies, Catboy. I'm Nermin Sheikh. We end today's show looking at how chronic hunger is still much higher than before the COVID-19 pandemic began. This week, the United Nations released its annual report on the state of food security and nutrition in the world and found key drivers of food insecurity since 2019 oh, were the pandemic, as well as extreme weather shocks and the war in Ukraine. This is World Food Program's Giancarlo Chiri and Marco Sanchez Cantillo with the UN Food and Agricultural Organization. It is estimated that between 691 and 783 million people in the world face hunger in 2022. If we consider the mid-range, which is about 735 million people, it's still 122 million people more face hunger in 2022 compared to 2019, before the pandemic. 345 million people are facing acute food insecurity. This is a, a major increase when compared to uh, uh, 2020. Uh, it's a 200 million uh, increase. It's a staggering. The United Nations report found Africa remains the worst affected region, with one in five people facing hunger on the continent. Officials say they're currently far off track to end global hunger by 2030. For more, we're joined by two guests who serve on the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems. In Austin, Texas, is Raj Patel, a research professor at the University of Texas at Austin and author of Stuffed and Starved, The Hidden Battle for the World's Food System. And in Kampala, Uganda, we're joined by Milion Bilai, the general coordinator of the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa. We welcome you both back to Democracy Now! Milion Bilai, I'd like to begin with you. If you could respond to the findings of this report and, in particular, why hunger has been rising in Africa for the last 10 years. Thank you uh, very much. Um... Um, it's staggering, as, uh, as you say, it, and it's, it's, it's very concerning. Um, for the last 10 years, hunger has been on an increase in Africa. Um, this is buffeted by the stresses, you know, the COVID uh, conflict uh, and the climate crisis. Uh, all of these three are not uh, from Africa. Uh, they are not originated in Africa, the climate. Uh, the COVID and the conflict between Russia uh, and Ukraine, uh, but we are we are suffering, and also the there is an increase even the availability of, uh, I mean the, there is a percentage increase in the uh, shortage of uh, good food, you know, um, but you know when we are talking about these statistics, uh, most of the time we don't put people's face to them. Um, I heard you know, a lot of uh, uh, people from uh, you know representative countries, also leaders of the uh, five UN bodies, talking about these numbers. But I'm not sure how much they are realizing that under be, behind uh, all these numbers there are people, people who are going to bed without food. Um, the second thing for me is urbanization. Urbanization is important, but unplanned urbanization is, is disastrous. And I see it all over Africa, and it's uh, also mentioned in the report. The quality of food in urban areas in Africa is decreasing. And also the crisis, the food uh, crisis, the price crisis, affects rural people too. Rural people are very much affected. Uh, but what uh, surprised me is, you know, the solution given by uh, many of the speakers, um, the technology, uh, digitization, increasing food production, and nobody's addressing the structural cause of this, this hunger. And I uh, myself ask myself, uh, you know, always, you know, why Africa? Why? You know, uh, the report says that it is tapering off in uh, Latin America and Asia, uh, even though it is increasing in the Caribbean and Western Asia. But all of the countries in Africa are affected. So the question is why? I think some of the reasons can be, one, it is historical. 
um, starting uh, from the slave trade and colonization and post-colonization. Africa is forced slowly but surely to commodify food and produce food for market, for outside market, mostly. And through the narrative of the Green Revolution, which says that you know you cannot produce food without using uh, agrochemicals, uh, without uh, producing for the market, uh, without uh, using you know uh, GMOs or uh, um, hybridized uh, seeds. You know this this kind of narratives is powerful narratives, and the debt crisis that we have uh, we are under it now, debt is really, really crippling the whole continent. And uh, governments don't have uh, money to allocate for produce for, for the production of food or to improve agricultural system. And on top of this is the elite capture of our countries and our system. Um, that, that is an old and uh, um, the product of the Green Revolution, and, uh, you know, um, really not thinking about the continent but themselves. The continent is captured by, by African elite. So all these, these structural problems are compounding the problem in Africa. So Raj Patel, could you also respond to the fi findings uh, uh, of this report and in particular speak of where they say uh, food security has increased? They say, for instance, that food insecurity is less prevalent now in Latin America uh, and also in parts of Asia, but then in Africa uh, it's been in decline. Uh, uh, hunger has been increasing for the last 10 years. So, uh, food insecurity, uh, for, you know, we, we're hearing so many numbers and so many different kinds of understandings of what hunger means. Um, you know, there's the, the sort of really chronic, uh, high-risk food insecurity when you're in a, a conflict area, uh, sorry, under nutrition when you're in a conflict area. But food insecurity uh, is the, the uh, uncertainty about whether you will be able to eat over, a, you know, the, the next few days, weeks or months. Um, and 2.4 billion people are food insecure, uh, but th that security can be ameliorated uh, not by, you know, producing more food, as Million says, but uh, actually by, the, by government interventions, by having a, a functioning social safety net. Uh, and there are places where governments have been able to divert funds uh, during the pandemic uh, to provide some sort of cushion uh, for their citizens. But, uh, I, I mean, the capacity to do that has a lot to do with, as Million mentioned, debt. Uh, and Sub-Saharan Africa is particularly indebted uh, and is part of a group of countries that is uh, going to see its de debt costs, costs rising over the next uh, couple of years, uh, while other parts of the world see those uh, those debt ratios going down a little bit. Uh, so that's partly to uh, a way of explaining why it is that some countries are able to provide good functioning safety nets, uh, other things being equal, because they don't have creditors breathing down their necks. Uh, and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and in fact all, all of Africa, is uh, uh, you know, particularly under the thumb not just of uh, lenders like the World Bank uh, or bilateral uh, you know, individual country donors, uh, but also the private sector. Uh, uh, you know, things have changed rather dramatically over the past couple of decades, where uh, you know, it, it, to, to 20 years ago, uh, really the big lenders to countries in the global south were agencies like the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund, these multilateral donors. But increasingly, uh, private sector uh, lenders are lending to governments, uh, and their interest rates are higher, uh, and they demand to be paid. And that's a problem when we're experiencing food price inflation and when we're experiencing surges in the levels of interest rates. So if you're a government uh, in Africa, you're uh, having to make some very difficult choices about how, whether to uh, divert what funds you are able to muster to make sure that your citizens are fed or you pay back your, your private sector creditors. And so who that's are these... certainly one of the... Sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt you, Raj, but who are these private sector creditors and what are the terms of the loans uh, that they give uh, to countries? 
Well, certainly, uh, uh, private sector loans are uh, a, 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 a few points higher uh, in terms of interest rate than the concessional loans that are given by uh, the World Bank. Um, so uh, the, the terms are you know, uh, uh, not as generous. Uh, they're able to sort of uh, be a bit more agile in terms of their lending, which is why governments tend to go to them. Uh, but there is this sort of shift towards uh, you know, borrowing from either you know, uh, lenders who are interested in uh, infrastructure, uh, lenders who are interested in, in buying up land. Uh, and those, uh, you know, the, 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 those lenders can either be local private capital markets or they can be international um, uh, you know, pension funds, for example, uh, in, you know, endowments for universities. Uh, we've seen a lot of very interesting and important action, for instance, uh, against the Harvard endowment uh, from uh, activists in Brazil who obs have observed that uh, the endowment is involved in certain kinds of lending activity that in in involve land grabbing. Uh, so you know, the, the, the private sector lenders themselves vary, uh, but what's always true is that their, their loans are more expensive uh, and onerous when it comes to uh, you know, th this financing. And I think what, what one thing that gets forgotten in all this is well, what, how is it that governments are repaying the loans? They're growing food not for local consumption, but for export. And this is, this is the, the, the vast irony here, is that food is being grown, but it's not being grown for local consumption. It's being grown uh, to, for, for faster than the global north to eat or uh, you know, worst case, uh, you know, for uh, anim you know, to, to be fed to animals that, that, that then uh, richer consumers get to eat. Uh, and so he here's this deep irony that we're talking about structurally higher rates of hunger around the world uh, and the way that governments are trying to pay off the debts that they're incurring trying to feed people is by growing food not for consumption by the local populations but for export. So, Milian Balai, I want to ask you about uh, kind of the structural conditions under which these loans are being given, uh, what kinds of food systems are in place and are being promoted. You recently co-authored an open letter to USAID that called on it to fund sustainable food systems in Africa, not another industrial green revolution. It began, quote, we are dismayed to learn that the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, recently solidified its relationship with AGRA, <coughs> that is, formerly the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, and committed to working with AGRA to transform African food and agriculture systems. Mm. Could you explain your concerns? Yeah, what, what's wrong? Um, I think uh, um, AGRA, as its name implies, is Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, and uh, the research we have done, you know, after Agra has implemented what it, it, it planned to implement. Uh, by the way, it's mainly supported by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, the USAID and um, other uh, aid agencies, and also uh, private philanthropies. Their contribution is not as much as uh, Bill and Melinda Gates aid. So they operated for uh, about 15 years. And we evaluated their uh, um, their, their uh, outcomes, and they failed. One area that they have succeeded and that they are still pushing is changing policies uh, and also regulations. Regulation related to seed, regulation related to biosafety, biosafety regulations, um, and also fertilizer regulations. So on the things that they are, they are said that they, they would succeed, meaning increased food for productivity, uh, having the malnutrition and whatever. But what they have resulted in the end is a decrease in the diversity and amount of production of uh, indigenous food, you know. So, so we have looked at this research, and I think they have done also their own assessment, uh, which, incorpor which incorporated what we have said. In light of this, we wrote to all of their funders uh, and have asked them to defund Agra. Agra can be a very good force if it, it converts itself into an agroecology, you know, an, uh, an organization which pushes agroecology. But looking at the funders, looking at the people who are interested in its, in its work, looking at its purpose, looking at the board membership of Agra, we don't think that that would happen. Uh, it's mostly outside control. You know that it's registered in the U.S. also. It's not African. So that's why. That's why we have, we have asked uh, um, an entity in the U.S. which is using 
public money to, to fund, uh, fund AGRA, to stop funding AGRA. Uh, Raj Patel, could you also talk about that? What are the food aid systems in place, uh, which uh, critics say, in fact, may be exacerbating uh, hunger conditions, and if not exacerbating them, certainly not improving them? Well, I mean, historically, the United States was tethered to uh, a way of providing food aid that really was about shipping U.S. food in U.S. carriers uh, to uh, different parts of the world as a way of providing a prop for uh, local food, uh, you know, uh, you know, lo local farmers and industrial food producers. Um, but what we're seeing more, particularly, uh, as Milion is saying, with things like the uh, Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, or AGRA, as it's now called, because it doesn't want to be known uh, by the, the Green Revolution name. They, they, they think it's bad branding. Uh, but what, what you're seeing there is funding for uh, the transformation of agricultural systems uh, toward providing more uh, processed food for cities. Um, and uh, as Milion was saying, I mean, the, the, this, uh, the, this new state of the food uh, of the world's uh, food security report uh, has another very new, uh, interesting figure, well, one that I hadn't seen before, uh, which is the figure of the number of people on Earth who are able to afford a healthy meal. And it turns out uh, that 3.4 billion people cannot afford to eat healthily. Um, now, this is uh, striking when set alongside something like the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, which is very interested in processing uh, and yeah. uh, you know, growing food uh, for cities in ways that are not necessarily consonant with uh, healthy diets, but are much more uh, around uh, supporting uh, industrialized food systems, and in particular, moving us towards ultra-processed food. Um, and that's a grave source of concern. Uh, not least because it's, it tends to be more expensive. Uh, you know, the health effects are uh, increasingly being questioned by, uh, by the nutrition community. But uh, in general, uh, the, the question of how it is that we're going to feed city, cities sustainably, not just in Africa, but around the world, uh, is one that is gradually coming to the fore. And unfortunately, our economic policy, our agricultural policy, our food systems policy, not just in the global south, but around the world, is not fit for purpose. It, it was set up to really support large industrial food producers, uh, you know, providing packaged and ultra-processed food cheaply <sighs> for workers in cities. Um, but that as it becomes sense. clearer that, first of all, that food is expensive, unaffordable, has vast uh, environmental impacts, and mm. now increasingly it's clear it is good. unhealthy. All of that suggests that we need a real turnaround in our agriculture, uh, food, and aid policy. Uh, and the agencies tasked with overseeing that are doing very little to address it. And Raj, if you could address what is now an immediate possible threat to uh, food access, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin threatening to abandon the Black Sea grain deal brokered by the UN and Turkey, which grants Ukraine safe passage to export food and fertilizer. Unless Russia agrees to an extension, the agreement will expire as soon as Monday. If you could talk about the significance of this and what impact it will have if the agreement expires. Well, these uh, agreements have often been grounds for uh, a certain amount of speculation on international commodity markets, not just, uh, as you say, for food, but also for fertilizer. Um, fertilizer costs have dropped since uh, the beginning of the war in Ukraine, where there was a frenzy of buying up and speculation. But it's still uh, at, at levels of far higher than before uh, the conflict started, but also far higher since b before the pandemic. Um, and this is a, a, an ongoing problem in two ways. First of all, uh, there's the, the risk of a commodity price spike um, for producers. That's going oh. to raise prices. For consumers, prices have continued to increase, uh, and this will merely add to that misery. Uh, but by mm. increasing the price of fertilizer, you kind of lock in these price increases for grain producers that, that farm industrially. Uh, and that uh, augurs very badly, not just for the short-term food price spikes, but for the medium to long-term as well. And finally, and very briefly, uh, Milion Bilai, if you could talk about some of the community-based uh, organizations that are working for food justice across Africa. Um, AFSA, as you know, is a network of networks. Uh, we work uh, with 50 networks all over Africa, 50, in 50 of the 55 African countries. We have a number of members. And quite recently, we published a book, which is called Stories of Change, Agroecology as a Climate Adaptation Approach. This is written by local people themselves, you know, people who are actually practicing agroecology, who are increasing productivity, planting diverse foods, 
reclaiming you know um, areas which are degraded and experimenting with biological seeds you know uh, for resilience uh, uh, production system uh, food forests in a lot of cases 12 cases in the number of cases are increasing and we have been also accumulating a lot of cases so local community I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there okay. uh, Million Belai thank you so much for joining us general coordinator of the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa Raj Patel research professor at the University of Texas at Austin and author of Stuffed and Starved the Hidden Battle for the World's Food System Happy birthday Karl Marxer I'm Nermeen Sheikh thank you so much for joining us Happy birthday Karl Marx Wait Marxer, I'm Nermeen Sheikh. Thank you, Battle for the World's Food System. Happy birthday, Karl Marxer. I'm Nermeen Sheikh. Thank you so much for joining yeah, I us. I thought you said Karl Marx. Did you say a different name? Is it Karl Marx's birthday? Probably not, right? I feel like one of you would have told me that.